Every day, our brains are bombarded by an overload of messages telling us what a successful life should look like. Whether it's having that 401k built up, making sure your kids get into the perfect school, or even just doing your best to be a good person. And sure, some would say these are ways to measure earthly wealth and prosperity, but are they really the most important measures of success? Are they really even successful when you look at what the God of the universe wants for us? Maybe it's time to start thinking less about what the world tells us is successful and more about what God wants for us. Maybe it's time to rethink. Good morning, Venture. How's everybody doing today? Great. My name is Kirk Perry. I'm one of the volunteers around here. And this morning, I get the distinct honor and privilege to introduce one of my closest friends to stage. The story began a little over 20 years ago in this little city in the Midwest called Cincinnati, Ohio, where 11 friends got together and decided that they wanted to create a place where people who had given up on church but not on God could get together. And they did something that I would think unthinkable back then, which is to tap into home equity loans and take out savings to bring this young youth pastor, his wife, and two young kids from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to Cincinnati, Ohio, to start a church called Crossroads. And that first meeting in 1997, they had 200 people gathered in a middle school gymnasium for their first worship service. When my family joined in 2005, there were about 5,000 people going on a weekend, and we moved out here in 2014, but the results today are incredible. In 2015, Crossroads, with 10 campuses, was the fastest growing megachurch in the United States. Um, those 10 campuses on a weekend will generate 30,000 people over weekend services, which is pretty incredible. They have an app called Crossroads Anywhere, 44 states, people worshiping live on Saturdays, and Sundays. It's an incredible story. But what I and my family really learned from Brian, who you're going to hear from today in that church, were very different things about church than I'd ever thought. Churches can be entrepreneurial. Churches can be unconventional. And how I typically thought of church, which was giving, was really flipped on its head and thought of church as investing. And those results pay off in incredible ways for the kingdom of God. They do an annual Thanksgiving drive, which last year provided 800,000 meals for people over the Thanksgiving holiday. They've sent over 2,000 people on mission trips to South Africa. And over the Christmas holiday, they have a creative execution of the Christmas story that draws 100,000 people in a city with 800,000. Given we have 8 million people living in the Barrier, that'd be like a million people coming to experience Christ over the holidays. But probably most impressively, when I talk about unconventional and entrepreneurial, they're in the second year of a three-year campaign. No goals, just follow God. What's in your heart? What do you want God to have of your time, talent, and treasure to help further the kingdom? They raised $90 million to further God's kingdom. This little flyover city in Cincinnati, Ohio, is impacting the kingdom of God. And we're gonna hear from Brian Tome today, who's gonna really challenge us. He's gonna make us laugh, challenge us, but also hopefully open our hearts for things we haven't thought of before. So it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Brian Tome. <laughs> Man, what an introduction. I, I think we should just close in prayer right now. Let's, let's just, because it can't get any better than that. Uh, now let's open up in prayer right now. God, thank you so much for being so good. And no matter where you are, you're, you know, you're over in the East Coast, you're in the West Coast, you're in the different hemispheres, you're all over the place, and, including places in our universe that we haven't even heard of. We just thank you for being so big. And yet, at the same time, being so small to engage people like us where we are right now. And I pray that happens and use the words that uh, I trust are your words to bless and build into your people. Help me to honor you today. And I pray these things according to the character and identity of Jesus. Amen. Well, it is great to be with everybody here from Cincinnati. I do have an inferior complex, inferiority complex coming from Cincinnati out here to the great Silicon Valley where all things great and huge and massive happen worldwide. You will know, though, if the end of the world comes, you want to live where I live. At least that's what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said, if the end of the world happens, when it happens, I want to live in Cincinnati because everything there happens 15 years later than every place else. 
Yeah, it's like, um, we got these new things, I don't know if you've heard of them or not, cell phones, they're awesome. Like flip them open, they're great, you should try those sometime. Actually, I'm in, uh, obviously, uh, an epicenter of activity in the nation and in the world, and part of what that epicenter is about is about venture capital. It's about brand new entrepreneurial things. It's about investing. And, and I want to talk today about a story that Jesus made up. They're called parables. This story he made up was true to life, and it's actually the earliest recorded explanation of venture capital. It's the earliest recorded example of investment banking in all of human literature. It's called the parable of the talents is what you might have heard it go by. Jesus again and again and again and again talks about money about half of the time. And when he's telling these stories, the subject is money. And one of the more interesting ones is the book of Matthew 25. It's a long story. I'm just going to recap it for you, and I'll give you a quote of it later on. It comes from Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. Jesus says, it's like a man who goes on the journey. And this man is God. God who goes on a journey, meaning he's not as real right now as we'd like him to be. Sometimes he feels like he's away. He's away on a journey, but he's away. He's not as close to us as we'd like to feel him, but he divests himself. He gives his resources to three different people. He gives one person five talents. This is a large sum of money a talent was. He gives another person two talents, and he gives another person one talent. And these people go off, and they do different things with the resources of the master, who is God, who is God blessed them, and built into them. Sometime later, this master comes back and he wants to settle accounts. And he goes to the person who, who gave five talents to him. Say, hey, what's going on? What'd you do? Well, five talents, I, uh, I, I just made it double is what I did. And the guy goes, well done, good and faithful servant. Awesome, good job. He goes to the second guy who had two talents. Said, well, well, well I, I need my jack back. What uh, would what, what you do? Well, I actually doubled it. I got four talents to give you back. Wow, that is awesome. And then he goes to the guy who has one talent and says, okay, how, I, I need my talent back. What would you do with this? He said, well, I know you're a really hard and driving person, and I, I just know that. I didn't want, I didn't want to, you to get freaked out, so I decided to bury it and keep it safe for you. And the master who is God looks at him and says, you wicked and lazy servant, actually, in Matthew 25, verse 26 to 27, he says, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew where I, I reap, where I haven't sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. You should have at least invested in the bankers. And what he does is he, he takes from this person and he gives to the one who has the most. Now, this is not only the earliest understanding of investment banking that we have in recorded history, it's also incredibly un-American. Very un-American. Because this guy takes from the guy who has less and gives it to the person who has more. (laughs) Oh, that's not right. Shouldn't we just like give everything to everybody equally? And shouldn't God be most concerned with the person who has the least amount? Three big ideas you have to understand about this story and you have to understand about God to understand how he wants to work in your life and my life. Three big ideas. Number one, he God entrusts everything. Everything God entrusts. Number two is God gives unequally. And three, God expects a return. Let me give you three again. God entrusts everything. God gives unequally. And three, God expects a return. You know, everything you and I have, it's come from God, right? I mean, how many of us did anything to create our bodies? I mean, we maybe rehabbed them a bit. God entrusted us with our body. You might, we might be excited about what we've made in business or what kind of family we have. We have to understand no matter how much we've accomplished in our lives, the beginning of it was from God. He entrusted us with it. You say, no, no I'm, I'm a self-made person. No, you're not a self-made person. Maybe you improved things. You did what God needed you to do, but you have a winning personality. Where'd that winning personality come from? Because your brother and sister might have losing personalities. They have the same parents. Same background, but you have an ability to connect with people and make a lot of money in sales. Where'd that come from? It comes from God. Everything that you have, our heart has been beating, depending on your health, anywhere from 50 beats per minute to 80 beats per minute, and you and I didn't do anything to cause our heart to beat. We don't understand where this electrical impulse is coming from, where it originated, but it's happening. God is entrusting us with a heartbeat. Everything you have 
and I have is an opportunity God's given us. And it's not the same as the person next to you. God is not equal in how he distributes his blessings. He's not. Um, some of us were born with the DNA that makes you better looking than somebody else. And therefore, when you go to a job interview, you have a greater likelihood of being hired because you're better looking. That's just the science. That's math. In fact, tell the person right now, turn to the next person and say, that's not you. Tell the person right now beside you, that's, that's not you. You've accomplished what you've accomplished not because of your good looks. Tell the person right beside you right now, that'd be... It's supposed to be funny. So, it's all about me being funny. I don't know if you thought that was funny or not. But anyway, God, God gives unequally. We all have opportunity. We're, we're in America. Even if you got to America or you were born in America, if you're in America, this is an unequal opportunity you have versus somebody who was born in Ethiopia and can't make their way here. Why, why is it that, that, that I'm 6'1 and you're not? Why is it that I got to be born in a country where I could sort of be free, but other people in other countries are born where they can't be free? Why does some of us have higher IQs and there's a better synaptic connection with their minds that causes us to make connections and, and maybe be better at math than the next person or something else and somebody else doesn't have the opportunity. Why is it some of us were born with everything going right and others not? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't like it. I'm not sure why it is, but we just have to recognize God gives unequally. One of the worst things my kids could ever say to me is this, no fair. Anybody ever have a kid who said that? Have you ever said to your parents, ever, no fair. When I hear that, I go like, yeah. It, like my neck like immediately gets tight and I go, oh, 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 you want fairness. Okay, let us talk about fairness for a minute. Um, uh, how many meals have I bought you? I'm just curious how many meals I bought you. How many of you have you bought for me? None, zero, not a zip, 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 none, zero, nothing. So here's the idea. I don't buy you any more meals until you catch up and because that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. How, how, how many, how many, Outfits have you bought me? How many pairs of jeans you bought me? How many? No, 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 zero. No, no, zip it, zip it, zip it, zip it. Nothing, nothing. So here's the idea. I'm not going to pay for any more clothes until you buy some. And I go, hey, hey, hey. My last child who did this, my youngest child, Mariah, she said, no, fair. I was like, oh, fair, fair. You want fair? Uh, Mariah, um, you, how many times do you think I wiped your butt? Just, uh, just take a guess. Like, <laughs> you had all these diapers, you know. How, how many times? Hey, hey, I got an idea. Fair is evening. I, next, time, next time I go do number two, right when I'm done, I say, ah, hey, Mariah, come in here. I need you to even the score. Come on in here. You need to catch up. <laughs> Will you ask for fairness? Let me tell you something. The last thing you and I should ever ask from God is fairness. Because as soon as he's fair, you and I go straight to hell. Grace is utterly opposed to fairness. Grace is God has blessed all of us with things that we never earned. Whether it was one talent, two talents, or five talents, these people all got something they didn't create and they didn't work for. And all of us have to have a sense of gratitude before God on that and to realize he expects a return. He expects whatever he's given you, whatever personality he's given you and I, whatever job he's given you and I, whatever mental capacity he's given you and I, whatever financial resources he's given us, he expects at the end of our life there will be more, more. Some people really struggle with this way with God. We're like, no way, I don't know, but that, that, that just seems right. Isn't God just here to love us? No, no, he's here to deploy us. He's here to enlist us in what he's doing. Some of us have financial planners, or we've got retirement accounts or whatever. Do you look for somebody who's just a good person to put your money with? He's just a good person who has some hard times. I think I'm gonna entrust him with my money. No. <laughs> You give your money not to somebody who needs it, not to somebody who's a nice person. You give your money to somebody who is going to grow it. And Jesus is saying, this is exactly the way it works with God. Part of the reason why some of us feel God and part of the reason why some of us don't feel God is directly proportional to how involved he is in our life, which is directly proportional to whether or not our lives are giving a return. He looks at us and says, what are you doing with what I've given you? You know, there's 26 letters in the alphabet and about 800,000 words in the English language. There's seven notes on the scale, on the musical scale, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. There's 10 basic numbers, zero to nine. There's three basic colors, red, yellow, and blue. Everyone gets those same basic abilities or that same raw material, and yet 
Some can do something with it, some can't. Shakespeare had the same 26 letters to work with, and yet what he did far surpasses the dime novels that might be out there today. Beethoven had the seven, same seven notes to work with, and we're still remembering him and talking to him. We won't be remembering Guns N' Roses for another decade. They'll be forgotten, although I thought they'd be forgotten by now. They're not. Axl Rose is still going strong. God bless America. But nonetheless, <laughs> Beethoven had the same stuff to work with, and he did something that is lasting. Rembrandt had the same three colors, and yet he's going to be remembered where other graphic artists will not. How much of that is the grace of God that came to them and gave them unique abilities? How much of that is they worked really hard and they honed their craft? I don't know. All I know is we know people who give a return, and God knows that as well. Matthew 6, to 24, Jesus talks about money again. He says this, the eye is the lamp of the body, so, your, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then light, if then, if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He talks about the eye being full of light. This is originally what he's saying is, there are people who have a good eye. This is an old rabbinical saying that if you're generous, you have a good eye. How many of us ever played Little League Baseball or, or went to a Little League Baseball game? What do we say all the time? Good eye, good eye, right? Some kid's up there and he's afraid to swing, so he just hopes for a walk. And every time it's a ball, everyone goes, oh, good eye, good eye, good eye. This is basically what God's saying, good eye. How many of us have ever seen your own eye without a mirror? We can't see our own eye. It's hard for us to know what's really in us. And what Jesus is saying here is we know by our actions, we know by what we're serving, what our heart is about. And he says, you can't serve God and money, or specifically says you can't serve mammon and money. This is the only time this is used by Jesus. It's the only recorded instance we have. What is mammon? It's really weird. Like, why does he use this word? Not sure, but we do know is he basically names money. If he just said money, which is a different word, we would talk about money. But since he says mammon, what he's saying is he's, he's assigning a personality and an identity to money. Adam Smith, the noted founder of capitalism, says that money is a neutral medium of exchange. He was wrong, dead wrong. Money is not a neutral medium of exchange. According to Jesus, it is a spiritual power. It's a spiritual power. It causes you and I to judge other people, to think more highly of them based on their bank account or think more lowly on them because of their bank account. It causes you and I to choose careers that we may hate because it brings us more money. It causes you and I to do stupid things that hurt other people because of money. It causes you and I to change our life plan based solely on the personality of money that's whispering things to us right now. And for some of us right now, it's whispering to you, you're not worthy, you're not worthy because you're not doing this stuff. Money is accusing you perhaps right now. That's what money does. Now, Jesus, when he looks at somebody who doesn't understand money and isn't growing money and is lazy about money and isn't investing it and is not honoring what God gives him, look at what he says in Matthew 25. You wicked and slothful servant, verse 26 to 27, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received what was my own with interest. He's saying you should have invested what I give you, because when I'm coming, I, I want more. What does God say he wants? More. Boy, that sounds really weird. Like, aren't people who want more, isn't there something selfish about them? Well, Jesus says it's what God wants. What does God want? More. He wants more. He wants more of my life. He wants more of your life. He wants more, more change in our world. He wants more impact. And the outage that we have with this is we think way too small. Let's imagine a rope. Um, there's some debate over this. Let's see how smart this audience is. I only know the answer to this because I just checked the compass. Um, which, which way is the uh, Pacific Ocean right now? Which way is the Who's, who, who says the Pacific Ocean is this way? Point that way. Who says the Pacific Ocean is this way? Point this way. Who says the Pacific Ocean is this way, point this way? Who says the Pacific Ocean is this way, point this way? Who is really not engaged at all and you are incredibly bored right now? Please raise your hand. Who, who doesn't like responding to questions from stage? My gosh, you people are like dead. 
chop, chop, man, I'm working my noogies off up here. And you're like just sitting there looking at me. All right, uh, let me answer the question for you. The, 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 the Pacific Ocean is that way. So let's, let's imagine, if you will, coming through this door is a, is a rope that comes from the ocean across the beach, all the way all through all the communities, comes here through this area, it comes right, right over here, and it comes out backstage. It goes all the way through the rest of California, goes to Nevada, goes all the way through Cincinnati, goes to the Atlantic Ocean, goes around, it goes forever and ever. What that rope, well, before we go, I need, I need a pen. I don't have a pen. Anybody have a pen real close by? Always someone with a purse has a pen. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Let me see. Can you throw? Can you throw? No. no you can't. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. She, she says she throws like a girl. We won't know because you just handed it off. So, all right. Now, so this rope is coming here. Now, check this out. Okay. Here I am right here. I'm going to put a little scratch on this. Let me... Okay. That, that, that scratch. You know what that scratch is there? Do you see it? You see it? Sure. Yeah. That scratch is your life. That scratch is your life, and that rope represents eternity. That represents everything that's always been and everything that will always be. And the problem we have with God and the problem we have with, with money is that we live for the scratch. I'm not sure if we should call our financial giving giving or we should call it investing. I'm not sure what we should call that. Most of the time, we just call it giving because... We're living in the scratch, and a lot of times when we give something, we don't see any return for it. Like an investment, I invest something, I want to see a return for it. And I think the problem for us, why we short-circuit giving and why we're not really bought in on giving with the things that God's blessed us with, is we live for the scratch. We don't have any view of the eternity. We really don't believe in eternity. If you take a look at how we live our lives, we're all about the scratch. We live our scratch lives. We wake up in our scratch bed, we have our scratch breakfast, we go to our scratch job, and we have our scratch lunch, and we come home in our scratch car, and we sit and watch our scratch Netflix while we scratch ourselves, and then, and then we go back to bed, and we do it all over again the next day, and it's just the scratch. We live and embrace the scratch because we have no view of God's time, no view of God's hurt, uh, heart for hurting people, and we don't Understand that what we do now, how we grow God's passion in our heart, how we grow the world has a huge indication on whether or not our heart is developing. I don't know anybody who would say that they aren't a giver. I talk to people over and over. And I'll just ask you, is anybody in here not generous? Just give, raise your hand if you're not generous. Just I would like to, any, anybody here not, not everyone, everyone, yeah, everyone believes that they're generous. We all believe that we do. And I think that we all are generous but it's different gears of giving, Give different gears of investing. I think there's, there's four of them. One is passive. There's some of us who are passive givers. Passive giving is similar to what happened uh, several months ago. I went to, I went to work out and... Um, Right before I got out of my, uh, my vehicle, uh, there was a woman came up now. And in Cincinnati, we're having, uh, we've had a, quite a bit of racial tensions. And so me as a white guy, whenever an African-American is sort of interact with me, I'm like, I'm trying to be on my games. I recognize there's something that's been really going bad in these relationships, actually nationwide and in our city. So I'm, I'm always trying to like, hey, let's, let, let, let's really be on my game here. So this person comes up to my uh, car, my truck door before I get out. And I'm, my, my initial reaction would be like, oh my gosh, someone's trying to do something. But I don't know, oh, we've got an African-American woman here. I need to be on my game here because so many of these interactions have been really, really bad. So she said, hey, sir, uh, can I have a moment of your time? And, and I said, sure. She goes, um, uh, hey, I, I used to be a drug addict and uh, this organization got me off of drugs. And uh, now I'm reading the Bible and I'm hoping you'd, uh, I wonder if you'd like contribute to this organization um, because I want people like me not to be on drugs anymore. And I'm like, Okay. Sold, right? So I pull up my wallet. I don't carry a lot of cash. I give her, I don't know what it was, something pretty small because I don't carry a lot of cash. But what was that? That was a good interaction and it was a passive giving experience. The marks of being a passive giver is it's infrequent. It's emotion driven. So I'm, I'm feeling this emotionally from this, from this person. It's always a low dollar amount. And it's absence of results. Like when, I'm, when I do something, it's passive giving. I, I'm never hearing how that impacted anything. I'm never hearing how that changed anything. And by the way, as we go through these gears, as you go to the next gear, if you go to the next gear, you'll still be a passive giver. Passive is not necessarily negative. It's just the first gear. There'll still be things that just grab you emotionally and grip you. 
We see this in our country all the time. Even, even these words that are just completely incoherent and ineffective words. Like, uh, I remember a number of years ago, the ice bucket challenge. Ice bucket challenge, and people are all excited, like I'm dumping ice on my head. And hey, man, uh, for ALS, it's great that we should be engaging with that issue, for sure. It's, it's, a, it's a sad thing when our bodies are breaking down. But here's, here's a news flash. guess what? Awareness doesn't change anything. Awareness, you can be aware of anything all you want. It's not until somebody invests and facilitates change that something takes place. People who are passive like to say things like, well, you know what you're giving is just between you and God. In other words, I don't want anyone else to know that I'm a loser. <laughs> giving is just between you and, your, and, and God. Yes, God cares. God cares very, very much about your and my giving, but Man, an investor never thinks that way. They don't recognize that what I do right now is going to be known in some way. The second, the second gear of giving is purposeful. This is, this is where we know why and how we give. We've got a giving philosophy and we leverage it. Like um, maybe you're purposeful because at the end of every year you give a stock donation to offset your tax bill. That's a purposeful gift. Maybe uh, part of, this is part of my purposeful giving. Whenever a family member or a friend asks me for money for a mission trip or something like that, I always say yes. Why? In part because I don't want to be awkward when I see them at a Christmas party and I didn't give them a hundred bucks. <laughs> Or whatever amount it was. No, honestly, so it's like, you know, even if I believe in this or not, I want the relationship to be good. I want, I want them to know I support them. That's a purposeful philosophy. The Heart Association means a lot to me, so I'm going to give X a year. Venture is my church. Venture makes an ask. I'm going to respond in some way, shape, or form. This is being purposeful giving. Now, one of the marks is it is intentional. We say the, this is the reasons I give and why I give. It's strategic, but it also tends to be a very low percentage of our income. In fact, it's not a prescribed even percentage of our income, which is the third gear. The third gear of investing is when our giving becomes proportional, when it's a specific and strategic percentage of what we give. Now, Bill Gates said something really, really profound. I just want to read to you uh, what he said. He says this, people are very nice to me. Uh, and a myth might be that I'm the most generous philanthropist of all time, which in a pure economic sense throughout my life, I will give away $100 billion. But someone who chooses to live in Africa and work in a hospital gives money, they may be giving up their vacation or something they want or need. I've not had to sacrifice. I have my plane and I can get a hamburger whenever I want a hamburger. So I haven't sacrificed my time or my economic well-being the same way that lots of unnamed amazing people do. You see, they are the world's greatest and best philanthropists. Man, that's profound, isn't it? Very, very profound. What's he talking about here? He's just saying as a percentage, as a percentage, there's people who are way, way more generous and way, way more sacrificial and that impacts their heart than am I. And Jesus calls us out. One time he sees a, a, a poor widow who's giving her last two cents or the widow's mite, if you will, calls her out because she's given a higher percentage. We also have in the book of, uh, in the Old Testament book of Malachi, the Malachi, the Italian prophet, uh, and, and Malachi chapter three, you might know it's Malachi, but it's actually Malachi. Uh, he, um, he, it's Malachi. I know. I did go to seminary. And he says this. Uh, he says this in Malachi 3. Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? Well, in tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. This is the one and only place I know of in the Bible where God says, test me, test me. See if I don't reward good investors. Start at the baseline of 10% 
of your gross income going into investment. Whenever I talk to my kids about this, I'd say, okay, here's what this looks like. Here's what tithing is. Let's be real. Tithing means a tenth. So God's this amazing investor. He gives you like first, first dollar. All he wants back is 10%. Bam, there it is. Now look how God, good, good our God is. He then says, okay, and then this next one, and the 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 next one, and one more if I had something paper in my wallet. All this stuff, you can do whatever you want. Could you imagine any investor in your business saying, you know what, I just want the first 10% and I'll be on my way. And I'll never bother you again. You'd be like, wow, that is a great screaming deal. And this is what God does as an investment. And I hear people frequently say, well, you know, testing is just from that Italian guy in the Old Testament. That's really not a New, New Testament thing. Uh, and, and, and you know who believes that tithing isn't for people today? People who believe that are people who don't, don't tithe. tithe. Exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly what let alone, Jesus says in the book of Luke, people who are so exacting and tithing their mint and their dill and their cumin, he says, that's fine, you should have done that, but you shouldn't have neglected greater things. Jesus actually affirms that 10%. I look at um, so many things that have um, happened in my life, and I believe it goes back to that thing and God testing me and God doing something in my life as a result of it. I'm, I look at what's happening at Crossroads and um, why I'm there and I'm like, I pinch myself, why in the world am I at this Crossroads thing? You know, I, I, why, why? There's other people who applied for that job and they took me, I don't know why. You guys are listening to me right now, right now and you're realizing, yeah, why that guy? I don't understand. He like, he's, he's mispronouncing words. He's like, he's, I think he's made up a word or two. He, he stumbles a bit. He, I, 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 I tell you what, I, I think maybe there's other guys that didn't get the job because they didn't tithe. I think that's something. Maybe there's a unique blessing that God's investing in me because he's seen that I'm investing in him and he is a priority. The marks of being a proportional giver is you're disciplined. You're di you, you, you don't like say, okay, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it this year, but you have a specific plan and discipline. Number two, it's measurable. You can actually and specifically, and you do every year measure it, and, and it builds our faith. Martin Luther said there are three conversions a person needs to experience. There's the conversion of the head, the conversion of the heart, and the conversion of the pocketbook. And the tithe is the training wheels to get us in the groove that it's not 10% is God's. All of it is God's. God has blessed me with everything. He's just so good to say, look, the beginning starting point is I just want you to send me a message that says you're on my team. I want you to send me a message that says you realize that you didn't generate this wealth and you send me that message by the first 10% going out to the one who invested you. The first 10% that made this possible. It's a great, great start. And then the fourth gear, the fourth gear is the primal giving gear. Primal. Primal is when you see investing, it's like, it's like, it's primal. It's personal to me. When you see that investing slash giving is a core competency. Why is that? Because my identity isn't as an American. My identity is as a citizen of the kingdom of God. And my king in the citizen of the kingdom of God is Jesus. And Jesus goes to the cross. He stretches out his arms. He puts his feet together. And he takes nails through his wrists and through his feet. Why does he do this? Because God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but he have eternal life. It's his identity, and I want his identity. And so I don't look at things like, oh, I've already given this, or I've gotten that. I go, hey, do I have it? Is there something I want to invest in that's going to prepare me for something along the road? This is why Jesus talks about different awards and rewards in heaven. There are different rewards in heaven based on how you invest the things that God has given you and I. Mark's of those of us who have giving as a core competency is we look at assets. We're okay to actually give assets. It's freeing. It's adventuresome. Kirk mentioned we're uh, at Crossroads in a three-year campaign right now, above and beyond what we regularly give. And while we were praying through what to give, personally, I hate campaigns. <laughs> I've led four of them. I hate them. Part of why I hate them is because um, I always have to feel like I need to lead, be a lead giver. I need to model what other people, what God may be asking other people to do. And so even though I think I'm on the first gear of primal, 
in the early stages, I'm all like, oh man, it's, oh, I kind of wanted to be able to do X, Y, Z. It's, 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 it's a, and I recognize the spiritual fight. I recognize it's mammon that's trying to mess with me. But nonetheless, I'm like, okay, I want the things of God more so on the rope than I want this on the scratch. So I engage, and when I do, it's amazing how God shows up. I've seen this over and over, because I've seen God's faithfulness for me. I've seen it. Our first daughter, we, uh, it was unexpected child, our first child. Um, we were married. Um, we were married, and uh, by the way, it was Libby's fault. It wasn't my fault. Uh, we had a child we weren't expecting. We had no insurance and like, how are we going to cover this or prenatal drugs and all that stuff? And we got charity care. We didn't realize the hospital had this fun charity care. And I went immediately, immediately, God, you're good. You're providing for us. We had a house fire a number of years ago. Our house fire, uh, we lost everything we owned. The only thing I had on was, or the only thing I owned was what I had on, my underwear backwards as I ran out of the house. <laughs> All I had, we had no renters. Some of you are going, why would that be? Oh, got it now. Yeah, the only, the only reason we're here today and recovered financially because we had no renter's insurance. We were really stupid. We had no renter's insurance. Didn't pay the 115 bucks a month or whatever. Had no renter's insurance. Had nothing to our names. Because people in the community of God rallied around us and helped us out. And enables us to, enabled us to get raw materials to build our own house. We did a modular home. I did all the construction on it. And when we moved from Pittsburgh to, to Cincinnati... In nine months, we made $20,000 on that house. Now, I know in Silicon Valley, that basically means, you know, you earned a new kitchen sink. But that for us, that's big, that's big stuff in Pittsburgh. And then we go to our first house in Cincinnati, and we're there for 18 months. In 18 months, we made, we sold it $75,000. I was like, oh my gosh, $75,000 comes out of nowhere. God, what portion you wanted this? This is your money. You've grown this. We're not that smart. This is your money. It's to the core. Now the current house rent, like unfortunately with property taxes, it's grown hundreds of thousands of dollars in net worth because of God's blessing to us. And when we look at this, it builds our heart. It builds our faith. So we're in the midst of this campaign. And uh, we're like, okay, what are we, we, we going to give here? How we, what per, additional percentage of our income are we going to give above and beyond or already far beyond tithe right now? What's that? And then what about what's the X factor that we're going to give Beyond that, which, I'm, which is sort of by faith. And so, uh, very rare for me, I invested in this business. I've never invested in a business before. I have a percentage of my income that goes to a retirement account, and it's out there. I've never like, invested in a business, but I had a friend of mine who had a, uh, a tech startup, uh, he, and it's, it was turning money, and he got accepted into Disney's Accelerator. And they were saying, if you come through the accelerator, we're going to give you licensing to use our assets, to use some of our characters. I'm like, ooh, okay. So I had a 10, 000, uh, an opportunity to put a 10000 bucks into it. So I put $10,000 into it. I think I had total in my savings, like go get to savings. I think I had $20,000. I said, okay, I'm going to take 10 right now, and I'm going to stick it in. And I'm like, this, this, this should be good. And then I hear, and then I hear where it is. We're going to get bought out, and I'm going to have my money tripled, like $30,000. i am like, Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. My first thought is, 30, God, thank you, that's your money. That's part of the answer for this campaign. It's awesome. We so made this campaign, it's you know, commitment, it's bigger than I thought it would be with all these other factors. And, that's good. and then if I have to make the campaign that, uh, that the accelerator didn't go all that well and no one's buying him out. And my, my friend, his name, is, um, his name is Jim. We'll, I, we'll, I, we'll call him. We'll just call his, his name. We'll, his name is, we'll call him Jim even though his real name is Bill Price. And uh, his, you know, I lose all kind of, I don't know. I don't know if I've lost it. I don't know if I'm going to get it someday or not. I don't know. But here's what I know. God has been faithful. He's been faithful. Stuff that's come, on my, come our way financially that's shown the faithfulness of God. It's God saying to us, I am going to continue to, to, to work in you because you're sending me messages that you're working in me. Here's my big goal for today. Here's my goal. All I'm saying is this. Just go up one gear. That's the big application. Go up one gear. If you're a passive giver, there's no way you're going to go to primal. Go up one gear. Be purposeful. If you're purposeful, go up one gear to proportional, to percentage. Figure out what your percentage is. For some of us, you just need to say, okay, I've been thinking about this wrong. It hasn't been about the 10%. It's about, is this my identity? Let me tell you, our culture is lying to us. America is lying to us. America would tell you that you're a consumer. That's your identity. You are an American consumer. Let me tell you something. God doesn't look at you as an American's consumer. No, you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. Some of us would say, hey, I'm a saver. We, we, we carry that really, really proudly. I'm a saver. I'm a saver. I mean, just challenge you for a little bit. 
Man, you be known as a giver. We say, what about a rainy day? I, I, I got to have some money for a rainy day. Yes, I know there's got to be something there. We gotta, but let me just tell you something. Say for a rainy day, you ever considered this? It's raining. <laughs> it's raining right now. You live in a part of the country where 96% of everybody you know isn't part of a healthy church and doesn't know Jesus. It is raining right now. Last night, thousands, tens of thousands of children died of starvation while we're sitting on assets. It's raining right now. Right now, we're doing stuff over in India where the rape for profit industry with children is flourishing. It's raining right now. Right now, the students of our country are so lost sexually, so confused sexually. Someone has to step up. It's raining right now. And yet, yet, we have some of us don't see it and don't want to get on God's plan. I'm telling you, you're, 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 a, you're meant to be a player in the kingdom of God. Get off the scratch and get on the rope. Join the greats who have all gone before us and will come after us, who see their identity and the blessing that God has given us. And we deploy it because we have a bigger vision for our life than building digits on the scratch. Herb Brooks, who led a really great team, the Olympic hockey team that won gold in the 70s, said this, you were born to be a player. You were meant to be here. This moment is yours. You were meant to inhabit the scratch in this moment right here. You were designed and destined to be a player. This life, you only get so many years, so many decades, so many weeks left. Grab this. Turn away from the lies that a godless society would tell you and I about money and embrace the adventure of being a world changer. God, I thank you for being so patient with us, being so gracious with us, being so kind. And investing in people who no one else had hopes for but you have. And we're honored by that. Help us make the right application and get to the next gear today. And we look forward, God, to hearing stories of people whose lives are different because of our generosity. And I pray these things according to the name of Jesus. Amen.